Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 24 of the Masterclass Podcast. As always, my name is Cam Brennan. That has yet to change. Although someday <laughs> I'm sure I'll pull a Ron Artest and name myself Meta World Peace or some ridiculous name like that. But until then, I remain Cam. I don't know why I just said that. Uh, Dave, how are you, <laughs> sir? <laughs> I'm doing great. I feel like we should re record the intro to the show, but we're just going to keep moving out. We don't edit for content. All right. Uh, it's that first 90 seconds. You don't have to listen. So. Yes, just <laughs> click on that fast forward button. Anyhow, this is episode 24. It is, what day is it? It is August. What? I don't even know. I didn't work today. I, I truly don't know. I didn't work today. Like, it's a it's Tuesday. The, it's the 18th of August. Oh my goodness. I know. Dave, that's another thing. It's going by fast. I turn, I turn 29 next month, Dave. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> Not I wish that, I was 29. Well, yeah, and I'm sure there are, are many people who do, but when when you're when you're crossing that initial, like, oh, my gosh, I'm like, because 29 is not old. It is not no, old. but you're a year away from 30 then. And that, that's the trick <laughs> that's the is like, down. oh, man, I'm almost 30, and, like, we don't have kids. So it just kind of seems like I should, like, grow up. Not that I'm immature, but at the same time, my dad... And my mom, at this point, let's see, I was, my parents got, were married in 82. I was born in 86. And so my dad was, my dad was 20. My mom was 22 when they were married. He was 24 and 28. So he would, he would have had two kids by this point. It, it, I just, uh, it's weird. It's kind of <laughs> like, maybe we should grow up and like be adults and, and all that stuff. But anyhow. Enough about my inner like quarter life crisis that I'm going through. <clears throat> uh, I want to tell our listeners, Dave. Yes. About a survey mm. that we will be conducting on our website and this podcast over the next coming weeks. And this survey is anonymous. So first of all, that's the big deal. It's anonymous. We don't we don't really want to know who you are in the sense of like where you you know, like what your name is, like all the, the stuff that most surveys kind of want. The, the, the point of the survey is to help us, Dave and I, tailor this podcast, the masterclass, towards the folks that we have already kind of brought into the circle of friendship. And so the survey is going to ask questions, but it is anonymous. You don't have to give your name. You don't have to, we're not going to know who you are, but it is going to help us understand like, okay, are we talking to a bunch of 25 year olds that are in seminary or are we talking to a bunch of grandmas and grandpas? Like that will change how we proceed. And we want to be able to provide honest talk about the gospel that is connectable or relatable to those that listen. And we understand that we are going to attract a certain audience. And we're not sure what that audience is going to be. And so the survey is going to kind of help us understand who's listening to the show and how can we better um, serve. There's a, there's a gospel word for you. How can we better serve the people that are listening to the show? So there will be a link in the show notes for this episode. And I'm sure many, not many, probably like the next four or five episodes to come to take the survey. So if you are inclined to help us get better, we would really, really appreciate if you would take a few minutes and, and take that survey anonymously. Any thoughts on that, Dave? No, just um, would appreciate your honest opinion and feedback. And um uh, doesn't mean we'll necessarily do what you say, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate the honesty. Yeah, so. this is not like a an information grab, like we're going to like, uh we're going to stealthily grab your email or any. No, this is a genuine opportunity for Dave and I to understand better who who's listening yeah and for us to go okay wow like we really have a connection with uh just out of seminary ministers well then that might change how we approach our episodes or it might be like wow there's a lot of stay-at-home moms that really listen to us <laughs> that'll change too because <laughs> we know nothing about being stay-at-home moms so we'll have to learn but the point is like this is a genuine honest desire on our part to better engage and shape our show around those people that listen so that's that's that now follow-up david yes this is this is follow-up would uh would you care to 
explain to the dear folks what we're about to talk about? Uh, <laughs> let's see. I don't know. If, do I need to explain, or should we just? I'm I'm gonna follow you on this one. Oh, okay, I'm, I totally <laughs> threw you under the bus here. I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, no, I it's uh just feedback that um we've been given, and I two particular things that I think were directed more at things that I said. So that's probably why you're giving those to me. Um, but I, you know, one of the things that is, um, we respond to people's questions and, um, talk about things. It just makes me realize that, um, one as I, as I, I, I believe we've mentioned here before is that, um, we want this to be a conversation. We want this to be about uh, dialoguing back and forth. And uh, by no means do Cam and I feel like we have all the answers. And so we appreciate people's feedbacks and, and questions and things like that. Um, and then two, there's just, um, you know, I think it's it's okay to uh, disagree on, on some things. Um, so... Uh, I guess do you want me to read the 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 question then or I think yeah I think for the our listeners um benefit that might be the way to go. Okay. So the first one says I disagree uh with Dave's interpretation of our society's interest in Bruce Caitlyn Jenner which we actually talked about in episode 23. So that's where this is coming from. Um being related to something that she did. Uh and basically what I had said was that um, she is defined by what she does. And then it goes on to say, rather, I think society's interest is in her embrace of her gender, which most people agree is an inherent aspect of a person and not something that they do. Yes, her gender has become a hot button topic because she did something, uh, but she did that action because of an unchangeable aspect of herself. And so... Um, I guess just sort of my, the first thing I would just say is that uh, Caitlyn Jenner, as a human being, God loves tremendously. Uh, I do believe that God doesn't make mistakes when he creates people, and the whole deal um, with dealing with train, uh, with dealing with gender identity, um, I can't relate to. I don't understand it. I don't know. I've never questioned that. And, um, the thing I will say is that, um, I respect people's decisions. Uh, I respect the actions that she has taken. And, um, I don't know, maybe this even sounds uh, a little bit, um, condescending. I don't know, but nothing has disqualified her for the kingdom of heaven. Uh, God loves Caitlyn Jenner, Bruce Jenner tremendously and longs to be in a relationship with him. And I've even read a blog that talked about uh, the church that 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 Bruce Jenner would uh, attended uh, with his family, and just how uh, just what a compassionate person uh, Bruce Jenner now Caitlyn Jenner is. So anyway, um, in terms of why I think our our culture finds Caitlyn Jenner interesting, uh, I'm gonna just say that we're gonna agree to disagree on on Caitlin and why she's interesting. I believe that the main reason that people are interested is because of what she did. Um, if it was merely just kind of an internal thing that Bruce Jenner was dealing with on TV and there was never the actual kind of outward change, people aren't interested in that. We all have our inner turmoil type thing. So I, I'm not going to say that... Um, I'm not going to probably try to put a degree on anything. I'm just going to say we all have our stuff that we're dealing with each and every one of us. And I, and I don't think anybody listening to this would disagree with it. They're like, yeah, I've got my stuff I deal with. So if it was merely an internal thing, I, I don't think that it would have the audience or uh, the media interest that it does. Um, secondly, uh, I also think it, 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 it falls on somebody being famous um, and not only somebody being famous, but, you know, uh, for somebody that does remember the Olympics in 1976. Uh, I don't. <laughs> you know, I mean, Bruce Jenner was a, a man. I mean, he was a guy. I mean, he was... You were what? 
I was like five or six. I was going to say you were really young, but, but I remember. Yeah, I do remember. remember it, and I mean, I remember. You know, um, I even remember him being on the Wheaties box. I mean, I remember my dad was a my dad ate Wheaties, and I remember the Bruce Jenner being on the Wheaties box, and I remember it being a big deal that he got a gold medal, and you know, it just was. He was a man's man. He was an American hero. I mean, what he did. Uh, I think any little boy would be envious to, to grow up and be like that. So, um, you know, the other thing is, is, I, is I've watched the show. I have watched the, I think it's I Am Kate. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and to me, it's it seems like the other uh, transgender people that are on that show um, feel, you know, have this kind of um, frustration with Caitlin and just kind of going, you don't get this, how hard it's been for us. And um, maybe there's some good to come out of that in terms of their uh, story being put out there or whatever. But ultimately, uh, like I think I've alluded to, I think we all have a a false self that we put out there. Um, We do it long enough that we believe that it is our true self. It's kind of the way we think about ourselves. And it takes a lot of work for us to discover the person uh, that God created us to be. So, um, I don't know that I've answered the question or if, 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 if I hit that on that or not, but, um, I guess my takeaway is, is that God loves everybody. He loves everyone he has created. And one of his deepest desires is to be in a relationship with you and nothing that you could have ever done would separate you uh, from the love that he has for you. And this is truly kind of one of those, you know, uh, an extreme um, situations. And I guess ultimately the second piece of that is, is I do believe that people are interested because of what Bruce Jenner did in becoming Caitlyn. I don't think it's the internal turmoil because we all have that. It's that, wow, this person took an extreme measure and is now on the cover of magazines, is now on uh, TV for something that has not traditionally been uh, embraced in our world or accepted. And it seems like it is um, certainly um, an event that has changed that. I think people are, you know, uh, not nearly as... um, I don't know. It's just like anything. I think people kind of wrestle with what they believe and where they stand on things. And... um, you know, with that said, um, I think God would desire for Bruce to have been Bruce and come to have known him in that category, in that category, in that sense, in that way. Uh, well, but according to Bruce or Caitlin, he he is a Christian. He is a follower of God. And he believes... I watched his episode on Diane Sawyer, uh, whatever, 2020 or whatever. Mm-hmm. And his his feeling, as as he has articulated it, is that is that he believes in God, that, that he goes to church, and, and his, his feeling is that God wants him to be a woman. And that uh, from the mouth of, of then in the interview, Bruce, this was before he revealed Caitlin as, you know, mm. as his new personality or his new, you know, being. Um, but his it was like, yeah, I would go to church and I would pray because I would wrestle with this. And his thought was, God wants me to be a woman. And... I don't know how to respond to that. Uh, You know, on a very service level, I would disagree. I would say I don't believe that that is true. Just giving my gut reaction, my, you know, I've been a Christian for many years, reading the Bible, I don't believe that's true because I don't, I don't think God makes mistakes when he creates people. I don't believe that. Well, and But ultimately, I think it's between him and God. Yes. And that's, it's not, it's not our business. It's really not. <laughs> and I know that a lot of Christians probably have a hard time with that, but it's not our business. Yeah. You know, it's, it's really ultimately between him and God. Now, if, if Bruce and I were to sit down or Caitlin and I were to sit down and have a conversation, I would give him my honest opinion. Because yeah, one of the things that in that interview, still as Bruce, this was before he he made the official switch. To See, Caitlin. I didn't know he did that. Yeah, he did a whole sit That's down. That's interesting. We watched it over at Travis and Becky's, mm-hmm. um, and we were just there's like six of us in the room. We were all just like transfixed, like cause we've never seen anything like this on such a public right, right scale. Sure. 
I personally, I don't know anyone that has gone through a gender change. No, personally, I've I, I, I've I mean, met folks. I've I've dealt. I've I, interacted. I honestly, the only I think the only person I could think of there's there's a cashier at the local Walmart that I'm pretty sure used to be a guy. <laughs> um, you, my my uh, daughter is in agreement with you. <laughs> um, she's a great cashier. Yep. Um, but. And a wonderful person. Yeah. Very she, pleasant, very... But it, 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 it... Yeah, anyways. So, anyways, in watching that episode, one of the things that, that was brought up was, yeah, he would go to church and he would pray, and and it was just, God wants me to be happy, and I want to be, and I want to be happy, and I want... Like, the whole... The whole... Um, I guess the whole point... And this is, this is a summation of a lot of what he said in that interview was that he wanted to be happy and he wanted to feel happy and God wanted that for him. And so that's why he felt it was okay. And I'm just kind of like, I, I, and it's not because he changed genders that I feel this way. It's because I read the Bible that I feel this way. Yes. God doesn't really care about our happiness. No. And that may sound like really mean, especially when I paint it in the picture of, you know, transgender folks, but like, you know, I'm pretty sure that sleeping with other women would make me really happy. I think I, I think I'm wired that way. Like I think I'm wired to have a sex with as many women as I can. <laughs> but just because that would make me happy doesn't mean that's an okay thing to do. Like I am married to one woman yes. who I love dearly and she's really good looking. Like she's a total babe. <laughs> that being said, that does not stop me from saying Oh, man, there's other good looking women out there too. I should go, I should go have sex with them too. But that, but because that would make me happy, doesn't mean that I should pursue that. And, and like, I I feel like I'm walking on eggshells here because I don't want to piss people off or offend people. But at the same time, like God does not give a crap about what makes me happy because generally what makes me happy is sin. Yeah. Because Immediately, I, I, it is. It's a total <laughs> blast for the most part because it's immediate. I can immediately feel better about myself, and then the guilt comes later when I go, "Oh, mm, I really, sh- I should have done that." That I, mm-hmm. bad camp. <laughs> like, and then there's the whole like, I didn't grow up Catholic at all, but like I understand the shame that Catholics feel, and so there's there's this the cycle and in this this idea that God just wants me to be, no, God wants us. To glorify him. Mm -hmm. He does not care if I'm happy today. And that that seems like God doesn't love me. But what's more important as a parent? That your kid is happy? Or that your kid is on the right track to being a contributing person to society? Like, if we consistently make our kids happy, they're going to be the worst adults on the planet. Yeah. And and so our happiness, God's God's like point in all of this is that our happiness should not be dictated on how we feel, how we look, how we act, what circumstances we are involved in. Our our eternal happiness is based on His goodness, which does not change. Yeah. And so for me, it's like Bruce just kept on saying. I, I want to be happy. I like he lived this life of conflict. And it's just like, yes, you've lived a life of conflict. Welcome to life. Your conflict happens to be, right. I feel like I should be a woman, but I'm a man and I'm a man's man. Cause I'm on the decathlon. Like I'm like the manliest man there is when it comes to sports. Like I can beat you at this, that, and the other thing, no sweat, but you struggle with this, this, I want to be a woman. Whereas someone like me, who is not very athletic, like I understand sports from an ele- from an intellectual standpoint, and I love sports. I was just not gifted at them, and I'm like, I want to, you know, have sex with all of the ladies, <laughs> mm-hmm. and that that is my struggle. So I, I like that in in my mind makes me happy, but that's not gonna that does not solve the ultimate goal, which is the ultimate contentment that we find in God. So we want, this is going to make us happy. That's going to make us happy. Making a lot of money is going to make us happy. Having power is going to make us happy. Well, what happens when we get those things? We're still not happy. Right. And so I, I'm honestly, I would, I would, I would love the opportunity for me and you to talk with Caitlin. Are you happy now? Like in five years, 
Sure. Down the road in five years after after all of the the TV show has happened, the the ESPY award. Could we in five years sit down with Caitlin and be like, are you still happy or are you still struggling with the same issues of malcontent? Who knows? Yep. I don't know. I feel like I just rambled there for a while. No, not at all. And the other thing, um, as much as I prefer being happy over being sad or stressed out or whatever, I'm kind of learning that there's there's a way to kind of embrace those sort of emotions as well of like this is what being human is about and um it's it's just i'll speak for me personally it's funny how hard i work to be comfortable how hard i work to because that's even my thing i don't even need to be happy i just kind of want to be like in this like I'm comfortable, I'm content, I'm not stressed out. I'm it's the American dream, Dave. Yeah, exactly. I'm fat and I'm lazy, and I'm, <laughs> you know. Um, but there's just certain things that have like, you know, when I'm stressed out, it's a lot easier for me to go to God in prayer and be dependent on Him and kind of in that moment of, wow, I just got to trust you and live my life for you versus when I'm happy, I kind of don't really... I'm not going to say I always do, but probably more times than not, I forget about God kind of a thing. I don't take that moment to go, wow, God, this is a blessing. I'm here because of what you've given me. I'm thankful for it and that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, being happy is not all it's cracked up to be. So, Shall we move on to part two? Sure. All right, so this is all from Jerome, who is one of our... uh, Oh, thank you for doing that. I forgot to do that, didn't I? Yeah, sorry. Jerome is one of our... uh, most consistent listeners and um, participants in discussion. And uh, he, the second part of his email says that when I think of doing something in the context of Jesus teaching, I think of the many commands to do something, things like love your neighbor, pray for your enemy, care for the, ne- the neglected people in society and spread the good news of Jesus. To me, this is in contrast to Dave saying that to do the work of God is to be in a relationship with him. And that being in a relationship is not really a tangible action in and of itself. Perhaps if I'm in a relationship with Jesus, I will love my neighbor, but the action or the doing is still me physically and tangibly loving my neighbor. I have thoughts, but I'll let you go first. You know, my my quick answer is I don't disagree with that. I don't completely, you know, uh, we can do many things, but they're meaningless if they're done in our own power. Uh, without being in a relationship with him. And I think this is exactly what the verse says that we read last week. Uh, And I'm going to read verses 22 and 27 of Matthew 7. So, and it says, On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? So there's all these things that we've done in the name of Jesus. And then verse 23 says, And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And so there's this element of, yes, we can do all these things. But if we're doing it and we're not known by God and we're not in a relationship with God, then they have, uh, they're meaningless. So basically, uh, as as I was thinking about this, doing, you know, the verb of doing is empty without knowing. If we don't know God, then the things that we do are going to cause us to be standing before him and going away from me. I don't know you. I don't care what you did. I never knew you. So yes, we can certainly do those things. um, But I think what is the higher value or what is most important or the prerequisite or the foundation that we need to, to come from is being in a relationship with him. Yeah, I mean, my my initial response is that while doing good things like uh, loving your neighbor and praying for your enemy and caring for neglected people in society and spreading the gospel are very good things, like you said, if those are not rooted in a relationship with Christ, then they are pointless. Like, why why would I why would I love my neighbor? outside of Christ. Like, my neighbor's super cool. She fosters dogs. She's awesome. She's a cop. She protects the people. And then when she comes home, she fosters animals. Like, she's a good lady. We really like her. She's a good neighbor. 
But outside of that, why would I love her? Well, because Jesus has called me to. And so we we treat her with respect. We we invite her over. We we are friendly and caring towards her because God has called me to love my neighbor. And that's a very literal interpretation because she's you know twenty yeah. yards away. <laughs> but I think that there's that the idea that doing and, and relationship are different is is an easy it's an easy dichotomy to fall into. Especially like when you read James and he says, you know, he talks about uh, uh, faith that works mm-hmm. being dead. And it's a very easy thing to fall into. Like, well, if you don't do this, then you don't really believe that. Or, you know, and, and the focus can easily become a doing. Like, do, do, yeah, do, yeah, do, yeah, do, yeah. do, 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 do. Also, you know, but like when we read the, the, the Westmin- Westminster Catechism, what is, what is man's like purpose, right? The first question, what is, what is, I can't even think of it now. What is, what is the chief end of man? Yes. What is, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Not to do crap. Yeah. Not to go do stuff. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. And in that glorifying of God and enjoying him, we wind up doing things for our neighbor, for the neglected in society, for the third world countries, for the people in our lives. We, But that, that stems out of our love for and relationship with God. So, yes, is doing things incredibly important? Yes. God didn't say, sit on your butts and wait for disciples to come to you. He said, no, go make them. Go out into the nations and make disciples. That is a doing thing. You, you can't go and make without doing, right? That just, that, that, that's how it works. And so I, I, I think part of this is how we are raised and where we grew up as to how our churches handle these things. But, like... When Jesus went and did stuff, he went and did it in the name of God, right? Like when he turned the five loaves and the two fish into food for, that wasn't just to make himself look cool. Like it was a actual example of the power of God here. And so I think that, you know, like I, I, I love Jerome and, and I love that he contributes Absolutely. I mean, like, I really do. He's he's a very good guy, um, even if Jerome is a terrible fake name, and I'm so sorry <laughs> that made that happen. But like, to me, the, I I understand where he's coming from. I certainly. I, I yeah. think I think that I really do. And if I'm wrong, you know, please correct me. But like, w- there has to there has to be like a, a two fisted approach of loving God and being in that relationship and letting that drive you to do the things that Christ expects right. us to do. Um, without without taking away from the importance of doing those things, of being present to the people, but that has to always come back to being in a relationship with God. Because if it doesn't, God's going to say, I don't know you. Go. Suffer in hell. Like, if yeah. we get down to it, that's the bottom line. Like, we have to, as Christians take our relationship with God first and from that relationship and from that understanding of what glory and majesty and beauty looks like, go out into the world and serve. Because if we go out from our own, you know, power, why, why waste your energy? Why? Yeah. Cause it's hard enough to do it with God at your back because the world sucks. <laughs> you know, like, there's there's enough things in this world that are going to bring you down and try and break you. Why why go out into the world without Jesus at your back? So and and I, I imagine that, that Jerome would agree with a lot of what we said. I just think the, the medium of email is not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. So we're just going with what we had and we so greatly appreciate the follow-up and the feedback and the the contrasting ideas that, that have allowed for almost 30 minutes of discussion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this was great. I, I, I hope that 
and other not people. to get on a complete tangent, but I think that's one of the biggest problems with our government right now. Oh boy, is, is we email no, Dave? No, email not, Dave. I'm not. Gonna, <laughs> I'm not going to say anything beyond that. We don't know how to disagree, disagree, and still be friends. We've gotten to this point where because we disagree, we have to be enemies, and I don't think that's the way things originally. It's not were. healthy. Not. For 200 years plus, I don't think that's the way it was in this country. And I do think that's very much where we're at right now. It's the, if you don't agree with me, we can't be friends. And I just, that's that's ridiculous. And, uh, you know, uh, Tip O'Neill, who was Speaker of the House, and Ronald Reagan, who was the President, did not see eye to eye on things. But at the end of the day, they would go to the, you know, wherever you go when you're President of the United States, and they would have a beer together. Mm-hmm. And... I, even in that, I'm not saying Ronald Reagan's the end all be all president. I'm just saying, folks, we got to learn how to agree to disagree because that's how things get taken care of. And we are so just at odds with each other on so many levels right now. But well, I don't know. Maybe that's biblical and that's, <laughs> that's the way it's going to be. So, All right. One last piece of follow up before we actually dive into today's main topic. Uh, our t shirt and hoodie campaign, Dave. Has come <laughs> to a glorious end. Yes, it is over. At, well, actually, no, it's actually got as 50 we, minutes as, as we we're record. Sitting yes, here. we were at 59 or 49 minutes and one second remaining. But by the time you actually listen to this, it will have concluded, <laughs> it will have gone up in a ball of fire. Um, the good news is that we met our minimum, and all of the t shirts and hoodies that everyone ordered will be printed and sent, and you'll get to wear them upon your body. The sad news is that we did not quite meet our goal. We we hit eighty percent, which we is a, a B. which is a B, you know, which would make me happy and my parents slightly slightly disappointed <laughs> if it was a math test. But we got the shirts printed, and so we just want to say thank you to everybody that purchased a shirt or a hoodie. Uh, for a small podcast like us, it's just really neat to even sell 16. Like, there are going to be 16 people on the planet that get to wear a t-shirt that nobody else gets to make. And it's because we sit in a room every week and talk. Like, that. that's just such a neat and, um, I think for Dave and I both, an invigorating idea. Like, 16 is not a great number. But at the same time... Because we sit here and talk, 16 people decided to spend money and buy a shirt that would not have otherwise existed. And that is so cool. (laughs) Even if it's a small number, like, that's just, that makes me really happy. Like, I get to wear a t-shirt alongside with 15 other people (laughs) in this entire world full of billions of people and be like, hey, we've got a connection. We wear a silly t-shirt with a bear on the front. And they know the inside joke. And that's just kind of fun to me. So... To everyone that bought a shirt or a hoodie, like, thank you so much. Genuinely, from the bottom of our heart, your hard-earned money towards these shirts really, really does mean so much to Dave and I. Um, we we weren't really sure what to expect no, when we started this. We, we just thought it was a funny idea and a cool shirt, and we were going to go with it. And the fact that, that, that 16 shirts and hoodies have been purchased is just kind of an affirmation that, like, you know what? We're a small show, but people still care enough to spend their hard-earned money. So really, honestly, genuinely, truly, from from the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much. Um, Your support does mean a lot to us. And we would say wear the shirts proudly, but as the (laughs) slogan goes, that's a bad idea. So wear them very, very humbly and watch out for the She Bears. Um, So that is that. Oh, one more thing about the shirts. If you did, if you did uh, order a shirt, we would love to see a photo of you in it. Not yes. to be creepy, <laughs> but if you want to take a photo of the shirt on, you know, just a table or you in the shirt, we would love to see it. So share it on Twitter or Instagram. If you're going to share it on Twitter, make sure to ma- uh, mention at Masterclass FM. Or if you're going to share it on uh, Instagram, make sure to tag Masterclass FM so that we can see it and include it in um, upcoming show notes so we can show other folks how good you look in such an amazing T-shirt or hoodie. Yes, absolutely. Well, Dave, I think it's time for our very first advertisement. Oh, okay. Um, 
uh, I, I wasn't sure how this this was going to go, but we're going to try it. All right. I, what I'm going to let everybody know is is that Cam has a different podcast apart from the Masterclass <laughs> FM, and it is called Perspective. Uh, and he's uh, recently revamped it. Uh, I believe you're on episode seven. You recently yes, did episode seven. seven. Was the most recent episode. And basically, Perspective is about Cam's favorite things. So if you're interested in hearing about Cam's favorite things, then we would like for you to uh, check out his podcast. Uh, the other thing is, is the podcast is about 10 minutes or less. Max. Max, 10 minutes. Longest so. episode so far has been like 9 minutes and 17 seconds. 9 minutes, 17 seconds. Most are like 6 or 7 minutes. Okay. So it's real quick. It's real quick. So given the complexity of who Cam Brennan is, <laughs> you just never know what you might find out about him. I will tell you this, Jay Cutler is not his favorite quarterback. So oh, yeah. he probably he, will not be talking about Jay Cutler uh, on his <laughs> On his podcast. So. Oh, Dave. <laughs> so anyway, you can find the show on your podcast podcast app of choice or at cambrennan.com slash perspective. So cambrennan, C-A-M-B-R-E-N-N-A-N.com slash perspective, P-E-R-S-P-E-C-T-I. V-E. That's a long word. It is. Whew. Uh, so um, check it out. Please uh, take a look at that. And um, I don't know. Maybe someday I'll have my own little podcast and <laughs> oh, I we think can compete you will. with each other. So. I, I, oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm truly will. kidding. So uh, oh. anything else you want the folks to know about your podcast? Uh, no, you. that was very kind of you to... Um, explain in such kind words what perspective is about but initially yeah initially it was like church culture and technology all kind of mishmashed and i just that's a lot to cram into 10 minutes or less so i thought i would kind of approach that from a more of this is what my favorite things are like the last episode episode seven was about soccer this is why i love soccer and why i want you to love it too and there's a lot of people in america that think soccer is stupid um but at the same time it's an opportunity for me to talk about those ideas of culture and church and technology from the aspect of, I really like this. And, <laughs> and, and that to me is more engaging when you listen to someone for seven minutes, just really like plead, like, this is so cool. And this is why you should like it too. That, that to me is a much more appealing podcast than me saying, mm, shall we talk about homosexuality in the church? Like, <laughs> which I understand is a very pertinent topic. But in a less than ten minute show, that's not yes ideal. So it's just it's my opportunity to kind of change the world, uh, which is <laughs> you know a uh, an act in and of itself. So anyhow, cool. Um, so please check it out. Yeah, you know if you're not sick of me yet, that might be one way to get sick of me. <laughs> Push you over the edge. All right, <laughs> I think it's about time we finally got to. I know. Our main topic. This is the longest we've gone, I think, without... I would agree. Although, I do think we've touched on this already. I don't think we've completely... Well, that would make sense, since we are professional podcasters, Dave. <laughs> what point did we come professional? Is uh, it, where's the tipping point there? <laughs> yeah, that's kind of like the, when does a fat kid become like, oh, like the fat baby's super cute. At what point does it become like, oh, he needs to go on a diet? <laughs> like, is it three? Is it four? Like, what's the... It's that same transition of just, like, we don't know when we were cute and chubby and fat to, like, oh, now we're professionals. We, we, we just don't know. I don't know. Gotcha. It's one of those things. All right. Shall we, shall we read the verse? I, I, I will uh, bow to your professional reading oh, <laughs> I don't know about that, but... All right. So Matthew 7, 24 through 29, continuing from where we left off the previous week. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a, lo- a wise man who builds, who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because he, because it had been found on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished saying these, when, oh boy. (laughs) 
And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as their scribes. So. All right. This is a, for those of us that grew up in the church, a very familiar passage, along with a very cheesy song. The wise man <laughs> built his house upon the rock. Uh, I even remember doing a puppet show. We built puppets ooh. and did a puppet show to this. Were you make sure? Were, did you make sure to only move your thumb? I'm not sure. <laughs> I was a master puppeteer at a young age, Dave. Yeah, see, I don't think I knew that. That's how cool I was. Just the lower, the jaw. Mm-hmm. I, oh, you got to move, I I you gotta move the lower jaw because that's how humans talk. Yes. If you do this, all you see is someone's nose. <laughs> so, yes, and then we visited the folks in the nursing homes and we presented ah. this. Uh, is it a parable? I believe it is a parable. I I would venture to say that it is. So we did this parable. So, all right, David. Mm -hmm. Oh, wise one. (laughs) Okay. David the Gray with your long (laughs) beard and wizard's hat. (laughs) This definitely ties in to last week. Absolutely. This is one of those episodes where we kind of have to go back to go forward. Sure. Uh, Why is it so important to do as Jerome would say, what Jesus teaches us. Like, why is there such an emphasis on doing in this passage related to last week? Uh, First thing is, I think God never tells us to do something. Well, he, he, I'll I'll do it in the positive instead of doing it in the negative. God tells us to do things because he wants what's best for us. And I don't know that we always come at it with that perspective that God wants what is best for us, but that is truly, uh, he wants what is best for us. So that's, that's the first part of of why, uh, we should do, uh, the second piece of this is, and this is, uh, one of the things that, you know, I think, well, spawned us doing what we're doing and where we got our name from is that Jesus is, the instructor of the master class. The reason we call it the master class is because we are sitting at the feet of the master and Jesus is the master. And, uh, you know, Dallas Willard kind of throws that, uh, kind of proposes the whole, if we were to ask people who's the smartest person to have ever lived, um, how long would it take us to get to Jesus? And, uh, the reality is, is he should be at the top of our list because he is smart and if Jesus was to live the life that I was, that I am living now, or the life that Cam is living, or the life that you, as our listener, would be living, uh, he would live the best life that could be lived. He would make, you know, when we ponder these, what's the best decision? What should I do? What should I not do? WWJD, Dave, <laughs> come on. Um, so that's 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 ultimately what it boils down to is is that, um. He possesses a, a, I've been reading the, um, been reading Proverbs lately and I've just been struck about the whole, uh, we should be asking for wisdom. We should be asking for insight more than anything, more than silver and more than gold. And Jesus possesses that. Jesus possesses, um, the wisdom of that one. He's the creator of all things. Yeah. He does have that in his back pocket. And then two. (laughs) He didn't just sit up there on his throne in heaven as the creator. He came down and lived the life in the same way that you and I did. And so he can relate. He gets the, you know, he gets disappointment. He gets pain. He gets, um, you know, I, I, I truly believe he un- even understands things like loneliness, you know, um, uh, for him to be fully human, he had had to have experienced the full gamut of what we experienced. So, um, yeah, it reminds me of Hebrews chapter 4, one of my favorite passages. It says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confessions. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace in time of need. Yep. Like he he gets it. Yep. It, it's not an intellectual um, exercise on his behalf. Like he came, 
and he experienced, and he experienced loneliness, and he experienced temptation, and he experienced pain and rejection and love and friendship and like all of the things that we struggle with yeah. and purpose. Like, do you think when he was 12, he knew what he was? He was a 12 year old. Everyone hates being 12. Like, <laughs> yeah. like he, he went through puberty. Like he understands what it means to have the feelings and situations, even as a perfect child. I'm sure his brother, like James was probably like, dude, you were such a butthole. Are you, ca- or why are you always perfect? Like he even dealt with that. The younger brother was like, Oh my gosh, I can never li- like, oh, I hate you so much. Like <laughs> I dealt with that, but it was towards my younger siblings. Not toward, I don't have any elder ones, you know, luckily I came first. I didn't have to follow them in school, but like, when you think about like Jesus as a person, yes, he was the son of God, but he genuinely felt and experienced the things that we have felt. Yeah. Like the only difference is that he didn't sin. Right. But that does not mean that he did not understand or feel temptation to do so. He just never gave into it. Yeah. That doesn't mean he didn't see a really, really good looking Jewish girl walk by his carpenter shop and go, Wow. It just meant that he didn't go and right. do, you know, inappropriate <laughs> things. He just left it at that. And I think that's something that we don't quite teach about Jesus, in my experience. Jesus told the 5,000, and Jesus did that, and he told the Pharisees they were a brood of vipers. It wasn't like Jesus was a 13-year-old boy at some point, and he thought girls were hot. Like, yeah. he did. He just did not sin in that appreciation of the female body. Right. Which I would love to know how to do. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, that one, cause that one. sorry, mom, <laughs> as, as a, uh, youth pastor, that was one of my favorite talks with the youth kids was talking about Jesus was your age and would talk about, you know, he had pimples, mm-hmm. you know, he is, you know, he had pubic hair that showed up and you know, just all that kind and of stuff. armpit hair. Yeah, and, 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 and kids are like, what? It's yeah. like, yeah, he he dealt with the hormone change that you all are dealing with. And did it without sin, which is like the most amazing. Forget like dying and coming back to life. Like <laughs> dealing with puberty and not sinning to me is like the greater accomplishment, which is ridiculous, but also kind of makes a little bit of sense. <laughs> yes. So. Anyways, sorry. I nope. totally interrupted. So um, it's going to move on to. What is Jesus referring to when he talks about building our houses? Yes. That's a great. So I'm going to, I'm going to defer to you. What is he talking to when he refers to our houses? Well, I I think he kind of spells it out for dumb people like me Mm -hmm. very clearly here. He says that everyone who hears my words and does them. So the people that, that listen to what I have to say and then realize that's really good advice, and then turns around and does what I say, will be like the wise man who built his house upon the rock. Then it says, when the rain fell and the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock, something solid, something meant to withstand whatever life can throw at us. Mm -hmm. And if you continue reading, he says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, is foolish because they built their house upon the sand, something that is not built to withstand those exact same storms. Yeah. So to me, what I understand about this is that when Jesus refers to building our house, it is what are we putting our faith in? What are we putting our hope in? What are we saying? You know what? When push comes to shove, this is where my money lies. This is where my bet is. Am I red or am I black on the roulette wheel? Because according to this passage, no matter where you choose to build your house, on the rock or on the sand, crap is going to happen. The floods are going to come. <laughs> your, like, your house is going to be beaten back by storms, regardless of you choose what is wise or what is foolish. The outcome of those storms is where you place your value. And so when, to to me, as I read this, when I see, you know, what is Jesus referring to when he talks about building our houses, where am I placing my ultimate value? Am I placing my ultimate value in Christ where no matter what happens, 
it will it will remain strong and safe? Or am I placing my ultimate value in being a white male in the world where I can exert power? Am I placing my value in my job? Am I placing my value even in my marriage as opposed from God? Like, am I placing my value in good things that cannot withstand the storm of life? Or am I placing my value in the eternal things that Christ says, do not store up treasures on the earth, as we talked about earlier, but store them up in heaven? Am, am, I, am I giving, am I living my life in a way that allows me to give up my control of outcomes to God. Mm, yeah. Because as it says, no matter where I place right. my value, I'm really trying not to cuss here. Crap <laughs> is going to happen. And I know this to be true. Yeah. I quit my job as a youth pastor for very, very, very good reasons. And the next year of my life was absolute hell. Like rock bottom stuff. I didn't really want to talk about bad. But that my my point in saying that is that had I had had my value been ultimately placed on my position as a youth pastor or, you know, the pride that can come with being a minister of the gospel, like and that had gone away. You know, who knows what I'd be right now? Mm -hmm. But because thanks to God, I understand in spite of my sin and in spite of my selfishness and in spite of my desire to not honor God, enough of my value was built on the rock of the gospel that when that storm came, even though I hit rock bottom, I hit rock and not sand. Right. Like it was kind of, it's kind of God's wake up call. Like you built your house on the rock when the storm comes. Sometimes he slams your head against the rock (laughs) and says, wake up, idiot. Like get with the program. And for me, that was part of it was like, my head wasn't buried in sand to take this right illustration much farther than it should be taken. My head was hit against rock and it was, you know what? I did the right thing. I did it for good reasons. And just because, uh, consequences that happened out of that weren't what I expected does not mean that God is still not good. And because I have chosen to build my life as much as I know how to on God and on the good news of Jesus, that when I hit rock bottom, I hit rock and not sand. I was able to bounce off of it. God was able to build me back up. And I'm st- still in that process. I'm still a sinner. I still have, you know, sin in my life. But when that storm blew through, I was not destroyed. I was brought down. I was humbled. You know, uh, it was really tough for Meredith and I for a while, for a long while. It was really hard in our marriage because I was dealing with being bounced against that rock that I had built my life on. But better that than making, you know, the angels in the sand, as it were, you know, like, oh, life is good. This is great. And then you want, oh, wow, hell sucks. Like, it is better for me now to be bashed against that rock so that God can build me up stronger than it is for me to think that I know everything and that I've built my my house upon what I know. So when the storm comes, I get blown to hell because yeah. I'm not built it. I mean, like, I don't I know a lot. Like I'm not a dumb person. For for a 28-year-old, I have a lot of life experience. But at the same time, what does that amount to in God's right. perspective? Like <laughs> not even a grain of sand on the beach compared to what he's got. Yeah. Um, so I think to me. To reiterate my point here for like the 19th time, I'm sorry. When Jesus refers to building our house, it is really where are we placing our value in the most important things that we have in life? Are we placing them upon the on the sturdy rock of his word and of the Bible and of the gospel? Or are we just going to go off on our own and figure it out? Yeah. Which is so stupid. (laughs) Yeah. We live in an age of entitlement, Dave. So yes. go find the sand, make a good <laughs> castle. I'm going to come kick it down someday. I, sorry. <laughs> no, you're I'm, good. I'm, I'm getting excited. <laughs> yeah. And there's, I, you know, there's plenty of examples of people I think out there that have put their life on the sand and it just doesn't, it doesn't, uh, well, it doesn't, uh, 
Well, and even people that would, even people like pastors, you find pastors that are caught up in financial like laundering or child pornography or just all sorts of just honestly disgusting stuff that you like at first, your first assumption is, oh my God, oh my God, I would never like even Mark Driscoll at, at Mars Hill. I would never do that. Well, yeah, you would. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, you would. You know, and and so I think it's it's easy for like as Christians say, oh well, non Christians are all about that sand business. I live on the rock. No, there's a plenty of people who would who would live the life of a Christian, and their life is still built on sand. It is not built upon the solid word of God. Yeah. Even though they may be pastors or elders or who knows what within the church, there are plenty of people that think their life is built on rock. And then when the storm comes, they find out, Oh, I missed the boat on that one. Yeah. So, yep. Anyways, next question. We should wrap it up soon. I think that's yeah. I I, (laughs) I mean, do we want to jump to the last one or talk with family and friends? Oops. I, I think that's a very uh, applicable, I think, especially for me, a, um, how can we, with friends and family members uh, who are building their house on sand, how can we talk with them about what Jesus teaches here and elsewhere? So how can I go up to a family member or a close friend or a coworker and be like, without being a total jerk, be like, you need to do this. Because this is a very, uh, there's Jesus draws a very uh, stark line here. Either you're on the rock or you're on the sand. Regardless, you're going to deal with life. Like crap's going to happen. But how do we approach someone that we know is is building their, their life on um, a poor foundation without coming across like an absolute butthead? Well, I th- and still bring the truth. Yeah, you know, I think it's this is one of those situations where, um, you know, coming back to relationship again, uh, having being in a relationship with somebody is important. Um, I can generally say things to people that I'm in a relationship with that I can't say to people that I don't really know. Uh, I think the second piece, and I'll just say from my experience, is is that I don't compromise who. I, well, I probably do compromise. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I do my best to live my life for Christ and to be a witness for him, not beating people over the head with it. But when opportunity presents itself, I seize that opportunity to say that, you know, as a follower of Christ, this is what I do. This is what I see. And um, ultimately, in everybody's life, those storms are going to come. And personally, my experience has just been is that if you're in a relationship with somebody and those storms come, you don't have to jump on that and start, you know, uh, beating people over the head with, well, if you just built your <laughs> built your house on the rock, it would have happened. But it, it, my experience is, is inevitably people will come to you and say, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with the storm right now. I'm looking for answers. Um, I, I look at you. It seems like you've got something different than what I have. Can you explain it to me? And so... Um, as hard as it is to wait for those moments, um, uh, we talk about it a lot, but prayer is incredibly important. Uh, I think it's a, um, you pray for non-Christian friends, you pray for those that are building a house on sand, and uh, God honors those prayers, and he will present those opportunities for you to share with those people. And I think the real courage comes when you have that opportunity. Okay, you've been praying about it. You care about this person. You're in a relationship with them. The storm has come into their life, and now they're coming to you, and they're saying, what do I do? And that's where I think you have to really be brave, because it's not always easy. It really isn't. It's uh, multiple reasons why it's not easy, and that's probably for another time. But it's to step out in faith in that moment and just tell people, hey, um, you know, this is the this is the rock. Jesus is the rock, and this is the foundation that you need to have. And and we seize those opportunities. 
um, I think along the way, there's just little things that we can do to let people know um, where we stand and how we are. One of the things that I share with people, even though I'm very much in a, well, I'm not in a Christian job where it's probably not very popular to say these things, but I let people know that I pray for them. And if I say I pray for somebody, I make an effort to pray for somebody. Um, and I don't think that's something that people hear a ton um, prior to being in those situations where uh, they feel like they need the prayer. Um, yeah, it is, in my experience, um, people that are going through a very rough patch are not opposed to the idea of prayer. No. Um, I remember in high school, one of my friends, um, his parents had been divorced already, but was go- there was some serious drama going on between the parents, and he was very much not a Christian. I mean, mm-hmm. not not even close to the idea of that being an okay thing. And I remember he dropped me off. I was much younger than my other friends, um, just because of how the, the age gap in our grades went. I was always a year younger. Um, so he dropped me off because I couldn't drive yet. And, you know, he was kind of sharing some of the stuff. And I just remember asking him, is it, is it okay if I pray for you? And his first thought was, yes, like, <laughs> please. Yeah. You know, and for a 16-year-old guy to admit that, like, yeah, he was he was at his wit's end. Like, my parents have been divorced for a while. Like, I'm used to this. But now all of this stuff was coming back up. And he was just like, anything that will help. Anything. Yeah, and I said, is it okay? And I prayed for him right on the spot because it was like I was not going to let right, exactly. the opportunity go. It's like, oh, my gosh, uh, dear God, like I'm not even out of the car yet. Um, it, it, it just amazed me at that, at that moment, like someone who was so um, unwilling to think about the greater, the greater picture was so focused on the pain in the present that he was just like, yes, please pray. Like I I'm willing to take any option I have at this point. Um, and so part of me like agrees with you that, yeah, like we should wait until that becomes the option. But the other part of me is like, should we wait that long? Yeah. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying completely wait, but those are generally the moments when they're, they're willing to listen and so I think you, I think you, like I said, it's, it's just little things along the way that you say mm-hmm. that you don't, you don't have to have the full message at that moment, uh, day in and day out. But I think just, just, um, you know what? It's a God thing. It's a Holy Spirit thing. If the Holy Spirit is in you and God is in you, people are going to see that. And it is just that God, I want you to be present in my life. I want you to, I want to reflect that to others. I want you to be the center of my life. And I guarantee he's going to show up and he's going to see that and other people are going to, or he's going to show up, make himself present in your life for others to see him. And again, it's, it's just small increments of, um, just being present to him, available to him, seizing those moments. And then really when the big things come and, and, and the foundation starting to erode and all that kind of stuff, that you really kind of, I don't know. There's, uh, there's no wrong way. There's no wrong way. <laughs> it's not always easy, but I don't think there's a there's a, it's a wrong way. God's a big God. So you've said, <laughs> and I would agree. I would agree. I think that's one of many people's frustrations is that he's bigger than we care to imagine or accept yeah but anyhow i think that that brings us to the end of episode 24 yes we skipped over many questions but i feel like (laughs) along the way we addressed most of them so some of the stuff i think we got to before we actually even talked about this that's because we're professionals (laughs) i think it's because god's a big guy (laughs) (laughs) i think i'll I'll agree with your answer and not mine but anyways thank you guys so much for listening uh to episode 24 remember that we would love to hear your thoughts um we spent the first almost half hour of this episode responding to someone's thoughts 
about our show. So please share with us on Twitter at Masterclass FM or email us at Masterclass FM at gmail.com. We would really love to engage with you because guess what? We don't know everything. We're wrong about stuff. We're not, I mean, like we're smart, but we're not the smartest. There are other people that are more educated, more experienced, or have different opinions, and we would just really like to learn from you. Uh, as we go forward, you can also check out the show notes for this very episode at masterclassfm.com slash masterclass slash 24. And if you're listening to this on your mobile, your mobile, your smartphone, I'm pretty sure you can just scroll down the screen to find out or to find those very show notes. Yes. Uh, so if you don't want to go into the year browser you can do that <laughs> um but again thank you to everyone who listens and supports the show and who bought a t-shirt or a hoodie like i never thought like as a youth pastor you make t-shirts and people buy them because they have to because they're in the youth <laughs> group you know but like as a podcast host that that's a totally different thing so the fact that people actually bought enough shirts and hoodies for us to ship and make them is so cool to me <laughs> so i just i'm like genuinely happy so thank you very much for listening thank you and uh stay tuned for um new things kind of maybe (laughs) we we, we, we've got things up our sleeves that's all i'll say cliffhanger (laughs) okay bye